in bipolar, most people have periods of elevated mood as well as periods of depression. 1% of the population have active symptoms in any one year, but if you look over a lifetime, it's about 1.5%. G'day, and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hutchins. Today, we are beginning a 12-part series on bipolar disorder. Formerly called manic depression, bipolar disorder is a mental health condition that is characterised by extreme mood swings of emotional highs, manic episodes, and emotional lows, depressive episodes. In our first instalment in this series, we are talking with Professor Philip Mitchell from the University of New South Wales. Professor Mitchell's research and clinical interests are in bipolar disorder, having published over 500 peer-reviewed papers, books, and book chapters on the subject. He is renowned for his work in the field and has been congratulated for his work where he was awarded an Order of Australia medal for his service to medical education in the area of treatment and prevention of mental illnesses. Hello, Philip, and welcome to Wellbeing. Thank you very much, Jack. A pleasure to be with you. Many have heard the term bipolar disorder, but what exactly is it? Uh, Bipolar disorder is a condition where there are phases in people's lives where their moods are extreme. Not not their normal personality, but periods during which they're either profoundly depressed or disinhibited and elevated. And and these phases are very distinct from the person's normal functioning. And after these episodes settle or subside, people just go back to their normal nature or personality. So these are quite distinct periods in people's lives that lead to them doing things quite differently to their normal selves. So can those with bipolar kind of, so you, so you mentioned how they kind of have those different periods in their life, they can kind of return back to a normal, like a, what would be considered a normal kind of leveled kind of uh, mindset? Yes, that's correct. So, um, so the, the, the hallmark of bipolar is this return to normal functioning. It, it's different to a number of other um, mental illnesses like schizophrenia where people often um, remain different to their normal selves even when the the intense period settles. But with bipolar, people come back to their normal selves. So people can, um, you know, get back to their normal lives, but they have difficulty often adjusting and making sense about what they did and thought when they were unwell. And I've heard, Philip, that there's different types of bipolar disorder. What, and like, what are those t- different types and what makes them different from each other? Well, we um, talk about bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. So really just to help um, your um, listeners understand that in bipolar, most people have periods of elevated mood as well as periods of depression. Now, if those periods of elevated mood are extreme to the point of people becoming psychotic, or where they do things vastly out of character that start to cause damage to them and people around them. We call that bipolar one. So those elevated periods we talk about, we call mania. In bipolar two, people still have elevated episodes that are distinct from their normal selves, but they're not as extreme. People aren't psychotic. They're not unwell enough to need hospitalization. And they don't do things, you know, that are very damaging um, mm. in, in their lives or the lives of others. So, so that's why we talk about bipolar one and bipolar two. Most people who have bipolar also have significant periods of depression. And it's interesting when we think about bipolar, we always think of the elevated episodes. But in fact, mm. the people with bipolar, they spend much more of their lives in a depressed phase. Um, If we think about people with um, bipolar 1 disorder, they spend 13 more days depressed than they do in an elevated episode. And for bipolar 2, it's even more extreme. It's well Mm. over 30 days for every day that's elevated. Um, So depression is the more common experience, but it's the elevated episodes that distinguish it, you know, from the common depression Mm. that many people have in the community. And I mean, how prevalent is all this? Well, we, we've done studies looking, we've analysed very large Australian surveys. So the, the biggest surveys of mental health in Australia are the National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing. And we analysed the survey that was done um, in around 2009. And we found that between one and one and a half percent of the population have bipolar disorder. 
one um, percent of the population have active symptoms in any one year but if you look over a lifetime it's about one and a half percent and and these figures are consistent with the better studies around the world. There's been large studies internationally in the US and Europe. Um, and if you look at a conservative diagnosis of bipolar, it's in that one to one and a half percent range, which means that you're getting about one in 70 people in the community suffering from bipolar. So it's pretty common. Yeah. And I mean, just like with that prevalence, I mean, is it something that people are kind of born with or does it develop over time? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. We, we know that inheritance is a very strong factor with bipolar. Um, so if, if you look at studies of the causes of bipolar, we know that inherited factors account for roughly about 70% of the cause of illness. Now, some of that other 30% are stresses in people's lives. There's been studies showing you see higher rates of childhood abuse and trauma in many people with bipolar. Um, but by far and away, the strongest cause that, that we've identified is inherited factors. Um, so you, you're born with the tendency, um, but not everybody with a parent with bipolar disorder has, has the condition. So uh, if we look at families, and we've done a lot of research in families of people with bipolar, about 10% of the children of someone with clear-cut bipolar develop bipolar themselves. Mm. Um, so you can already calculate, if we're saying 10% develop bipolar if you've got a bipolar parent, and we all already said that about 1.5% of the community have bipolar, so it's increasing your rate quite dramatically. Um, so it, genetics is a strong mm. factor, but we also know that there are stresses that can trigger off individual episodes in people prone to bipolar. So there's this interplay between an inherited tendency and things happening in your life that are stressful or difficult. Would you say that with those genetic factors that when somebody is kind of born with a predisposition to it, is there something different in their brain that's like slightly different in their brain that's kind of an indicator that this is kind of happening or like, yeah... Well, it's a, that's a really interesting question because it's one of, one of the areas that um, our research team has focused on. And we recently published in the American Journal of Psychiatry a, a paper looking at neuroimaging or brain imaging studies of young people with a parent with bipolar disorder. Um, so we've had this large study, we call this the kids and sib study, so it's kids of people with bipolar or siblings of people with bipolar, the sibs. Um, and we have um, uh, recruited over 180 people who have a parent or sibling with very clear-cut bipolar. We recruited and identified them before the bipolar developed. And what we found when we looked at the brains is that there are changes happening in the emotional part of the brain, deep in the brain, the, the limbic areas and other areas involved in thinking, and that these areas don't develop as strongly. You know, we're able these mm -hmm. days to look at networks in the brain, and, and it's very cutting-edge technology. And we've found that before bipolar develops, these areas, these structures, these networks aren't developing as strongly as in people with no family history of mental illness. We also found that those who went on to develop a manic or a hypomanic episode, hypomanic means less severe but the same character as mania, that they had a more um, pronounced weakening of these areas. So the, the evidence that um, developing suggests that the changes in the brain are happening even before the illness develops. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is bipolar expert Dr. Philip Mitchell from the University of New South Wales, where we are discussing bipolar disorder. Yeah, I, I, and I mean, on those brain networks, I mean, are we finding that it is the brain networks to do with emotions more than anything else when it comes to bipolar that are being affected? Yes, it's it, 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 that, that's what we're finding. So we've been able to look at networks within the brain and we look at all networks across the brain and the ones that differentiate or distinguish between people with a history of bipolar 
and those without a history of mental illness, mental illness are these areas involved in mood and emotion. Also, to some extent, involved in um, thought processes as well, but the strong is areas involved in emotion. And it's very striking that most of the other networks in the brain are completely the same as people without mental illness in their families. And you mentioned mania a little bit earlier. I mean, what, what is mania? Like, what, what does it make people do? So mania is the extreme of elevated moods and um, the episodes can go on um, for weeks or even months. And, and when people are manic, they, they're just very different to their normal selves. And I just emphasise for your listeners that people with bipolar are no different to other people in the community when they're well, you know, that they are functioning, they have um, no difference in their personalities or behaviour, their ability to relate to people. So inherently, people with bipolar, when you come across them when they're well, they're no different to you and me. But when people are manic, they're just very different. Um, so what are some of the things that, that might happen when people are manic? That One of the big problems is people um, lose their judgment. They mm. become disinhibited. So people might do things like spend a lot of money, um, or be overly generous compared to their normal selves. And this can get people into problems financially. And uh, we know that particularly with the ability to purchase things online, um, that people can rack up debts very quickly. And this can vary from somebody who has a lot of financial means. I've had people um, who are wealthy by buildings or cars or even small planes. Mm. Um, to people of limited financial means who, who, and who, who might sort of spend enormous amounts of money on clothing or electrical appliances or on their hobbies, you know, for example, craft. So um, it, it varies by people's interests, but, but um, spending a lot of money is one of them. The, the other, sort of one of the other common ways that the disinhibition can show itself is people's sex drive or libido increases. Mm. So you have a person, for example, who is in a stable relationship, they're loyal within the relationship, but when they go manic, the sex drive just rockets up and, and you have people in those situations having affairs, perhaps becoming even promiscuous, and later on have enormous regrets about what they've done. But it, it, it's like an overwhelming drive. Um, some of the other things that can happen when people are manic, they can be more irritable than usual or much more demanding than usual. So the, the behavior is very different and people also become very active. They find it hard to focus. So, so you get someone who normally is you know, very capable, whether you know, their role is around the house or in a business or a person who is normally able to get things organized, get things done, they flip from topic to topic, idea to idea, um, so they don't actually achieve and accomplish and finish tasks. So you get the most mm. capable individual. Their life becomes chaotic at that point. So it sounds like the decision-making part of the brain is, a, is, a, is affected a bit. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair comment to make, and that's why I was saying also some of the areas that are involved in, in thoughts and thought control can become affected. So it's probably a mix of the emotions affecting the decision-making as well as the, it's not just entirely decision-making capacity. The emotions become very intense when people are manic. Um, and it's interesting, most people when they're manic have some degree of euphoria or elevation, but often mixed in with that is many people also get quite irritable. So you can have the most mild-mannered person becoming quite angry and irritable when they're manic. And I remember a number of years ago, a woman that I was looking after um, in middle age who um, just the sort of the most delightful person when she was unwell, but when she was manic, the irritability would just intensify and she actually became quite physically aggressive. Um, so you get these quite disturbed behaviours that are, um, are like a distortion of the mm. individual's normal personality. And it can be very distressing for those around them, you know, their family and their friends. And I mean, on the flip side, I mean, the depressive episodes, I mean, what is like, what's going on with when someone's going through a depressive episode? Well, the depressions tend to be long lasting. They often last for months. Um, when, so it's not just I'm feeling a bit depressed for a few minutes or a few hours. 
So it, it, it hits people for prolonged periods. Um, so people, as opposed to mania, where we were speaking, people are often overactive, they're busy. When people are depressed with bipolar, they're often much more slowed down and they'll say to you, they feel much more tired. So spent may spend much of their day in bed or just sitting um, in a chair around the house not doing anything. Um, they'll often say that they have less energy, they feel physically slowed down, and it's a very physical thing. Um, I remember one patient was saying that that sort of impact on energy and drive and motivation is a bit like how you feel if you have a bad case of the flu, but it goes on for weeks and months. So people, um, they feel sad, they feel depressed, they may have suicidal thoughts and we know that when people are depressed with bipolar there's a high risk of them ending their life by suicide so that's one of the safety issues we need to watch for when we're helping people with bipolar um, many people when they're depressed say that they um, have they're just enormously tired and and sleep more than usual and this is quite distinct from normal depression that most people experience where you have trouble sleeping. Um, in bipolar, people sleep excessively. So it's not uncommon um, when I ask people how many hours do you sleep over a day, if you add together nighttime and daytime sleep, people will say 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day. Mm. I've had other people say 18 hours a day. And they just struggle to keep awake. It's not as if they're hiding from the world. Um, often also they'll eat excessively. You know, we all comfort eat at times when we're under stress, but um, part of bipolar is often this increased urge to eat um, so that people might in fact put on weight when they're depressed. Mm. And, and the thoughts are negative, they're self-critical. And the other thing about the thinking is that people often say it's hard to think clearly. I can't concentrate on things. I can't focus. So that makes it hard to do even very basic tasks at home or at work. So the concentration is, 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 is impaired and people often say they just can't think as clearly. So there's quite sort of broad impacts both with depression and mania. And have you found that with with a depressive episode and someone that has bipolar is different to like normal depression or are they pretty similar? Well, it's, it, it, that's a question that our research group has looked at and we've published some important papers in the area. And when we first started looking at this, um, a number of the leading figures around the world said the depression is no different, it's exactly the same. Um, but there have been historical differences described, and we examined these in research studies where we looked at large numbers of, of patients. And what we found was a number of those things we spoke about before, um, and they, they're not distinctly different. So you can't look at someone and say, oh, they've got bipolar mm -hmm. depression, someone's got unipolar. But there are features that are much more common in bipolar. So those issues of sleeping more, of being slowed down, of eating more, um, some of the other things that this, that are more common in people with bipolar, they might have little, little interspersals of elevated mood mixed into the depression. So we call these mixed presentations. So, And it's one of the things that um, we see with bipolar, that while someone um, may be predominantly depressed or predominantly elevated, you get little flickerings or um, interspersals of the opposite phase. So when someone's depressed, they might have very short periods, you know, for minutes or hours where they feel elevated and energized. Um, they also may be more likely to be psychotic. That's still um, common in bipolar depression, but it's more common than in unipolar. Um, so, so we we published these findings and it was interesting within a few years there were reports um, from China showing very similar findings and when I've spoken at conferences in Asia people say we see the same thing in our bipolar people they sleep more they're slow they may be more psychotic um, and also our American colleagues reported very similar findings so it looks as though no matter what your nationality or ethnicity there are these features that are much more common when people with bipolar are depressed compared to unipolar depression or the more common experience of depression. Can these depressive episodes come out of nowhere or, or are they triggered? They can be both, um, Jack. So the 
Um, the episodes may have a life of their own from the beginning, um, and that can occur. But I think quite frequently in people with clear bipolar, the, the, the individual episodes of highs and lows can often be triggered by life stresses. I think it varies very much from person to person. You see people whose the episodes really seem to have a life of their own, irrespective of what's happening in someone's life. But for other people, the episodes are very related to stresses happening in their lives. I think one of the most striking examples um, I saw was a number of years ago with a person with very clear episodes of, of mania. But they mainly occurred when um, that person was moving house. I think moving house is one of the big underrated stresses of our lives. And it was, you know, the whole thing of the change, you know, of, 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 of accommodation, the packing, all the stress of that. Um, so for some people, episodes are stress related. For some people, there's no link. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is bipolar expert Dr. Philip Mitchell from the University of New South Wales, where we are discussing bipolar disorder. We touched on the brain pathways and that that there's been found to be differences in brain pathways with those that have bipolar parents. And I'm just thinking, like, can bipolar disappear and the re- person return to normal? Or is it because of those brain pathways that are, that are different that that can't really happen? Well, um, uh, between episodes, people do recover um, so that you can have you know, an episode of mania for weeks or months, then recover or an episode of depression for weeks or months. But I, I think that part of the vulnerability for future episodes is, and the way that I'm now thinking about it, is that these pathways um, are not as strong or as, eff- or as effective in people with bipolar, and that makes them prone to future episodes. And, and also that sort of brings in when people get stressed that the areas of the brain that um, deal with our, our, our healthy um, adaptation and response to stress that we all have just aren't working as efficiently so that the, the fact that some of the networks aren't as efficient and aren't as strong to me makes sense as to why people might have future episodes. And th- this also highlights the importance of medications because medications mm. can make a huge difference and we'll probably talk about that later um, and also good psychological care in conjunction with with um, medications so um, without medications people um, have high relapse rates and we know this is a condition for most people um, that it tends to come back again it tends to recur um, for some people, the recurrence rates are frequent. So they might have a um, number of episodes each year or maybe a number of episodes each year or two. Others don't have many across their lifetime and it only may occur under periods of, of profound stress. So it's quite variable. But the nature of the illness is it's a recurrent condition. And and when people ask me, you know, after a few episodes, can I come off medications? Um, my comment is, well, it's your life, it's your choice, and I always adhere to that. Um, but I emphasize that this is a condition that tends to recur. Mm. And the, the, the benefit of the medications is it can stabilize people's moods, therefore they can get back into life again. One of the issues is that bipolar often first presents in the late teenage years or 20s, um, and that means that it's affecting the normal things that people do at that stage of life, you know, with their schooling, their, um, if they're going on to do a trade certificate or university studies, their relationships, you know, having girlfriend, boyfriend, um, and their involvement in society and all the social things that people do at those ages. So if you're in hospital or having severe episodes that are stopping you engaging in life, that could have a big impact on you know, the important things that mm. are part of the normal life of a teenager or someone in their 20s. How should we frame bipolar? Because is it a disability? Is it a brain disorder? Like, what, how do we, in, like in the researching sector, how do we, how do we frame it? Well, I, I, I have no doubt it, it's um, a medical condition like, you know, diabetes, um, and other conditions that can impact upon people. Um, it, it has secondary disability. 
So there's no doubt that it causes disability if it's poorly treated. We know that people with bipolar, that they um, are less likely if the illness is unstable to be a hold to be able to hold down a job. So they're more likely to be unemployed. They're more likely uh, to have broken relationships or not being able to establish relationships. Um, and because of the uh, um, employment issues, they're more likely to have financial difficulties with a higher likelihood of being on Centrelink benefits. Um, so there are all these ramifications um, but it's one of those and, and when you meet people with bipolar you see them well you see them unwell it just hits you in the mm. face that there's something physical going on in the brain here um, and that the medications can have a huge impact and you know, not everybody benefits strongly from medications and we can talk about that but most people benefit to some extent so I have no doubt that it's a medical condition and all the evidence um, that is accumulating confirms that, but certainly it impacts upon people's ability, you know, their financial mm, status mm. and their relationships. Yeah. What are some of those medications available? The, the the medications for bipolar are what we call mood stabilizing medications, and that 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 term captures the essence of them. So the aim is to get stability of your moods. Mm. Um, that the um, the medications are helpful in the um, acute phase of mania and depression. Um, so they help people when they're in the intense phase of um, illness, um, but they also reduce the likelihood of relapse and recurrence. So there's two aspects to them. One is to get you better out of the current episode, but the second, and in many ways, probably over a person's life, the most important is either to stop recurrences, to make them less frequent mm. or make them less severe. And for most people, we can achieve that. doesn't always abolish the illness. And I think probably your average person, they still get swings um, in their mood, but the medications reduce the intensity and frequency of those. And that can just make a huge difference in people's capacity to engage in normal life. I would imagine too that along with medication, a big part of like that recovery process or that management process of bipolar is talk therapy. Yeah, and, and as I mentioned earlier on, the psychological therapy is a very important component of what we offer. I, I think it's important firstly to emphasize they don't replace the medications mm -hmm. um, and um, that all the studies that have been done that have shown the benefit of psychological treatment have always emphasized that you need to be on medications as well. It, it's not like straight depression where sometimes um, people, you know, don't need medications, often don't, and the psychological or talking therapies um, can often be as effective as medications. But with bipolar, it's different. Um, but I view um, the, the combination of using the appropriate medications and a relevant psychological therapy as the, the gold standard package that we can offer people. And our own group, uh, we've um, published a number of studies over the years showing the benefit of cognitive therapy. We've also shown um, the benefit of mindfulness um, therapy, which is a version of cognitive therapy, particularly for people with bipolar who also have a lot of anxiety. And that's not rare. We know that about 50% of people with bipolar have an anxiety disorder. Um, also, 50% have a substance use disorder. So these are what we call comorbid or concurrent conditions. And these need to be taken into account. You know, when we're helping someone with bipolar, helping their anxiety and substance use. Um, so I think the message that we're really wanting to make is that the best treatment is a combination of medications and good, st good standard and good quality and appropriate psychological treatment. And I've been very impressed by the benefit of that 
So some of the things the psychological treatment may focus on are what are there stresses that trigger off episodes? You know, can you pick early warning signs? Because if you can get in early, it might stop someone going into severe manic or depressed episodes. Um, so, for example, we might pick up early features of mania. So someone might say, oh, I don't need as much sleep for a few days or I'm a, a little bit more overactive. So if you can get in early, that can help. Teaching people sort of to become aware of um, you know how, the, how they deal with the stresses, avoiding substance use, because we know substances of abuse like stimulants, uh, marijuana can worsen the likelihood and increase your risk of becoming manic. Um, so there are a number of important treatments. And also, how do people deal with having bipolar? How do they make sense of it mm. so they can sort of get a better handle and control over it? Because I think often people with this condition just feel out of control. What can I do, you know, to, to get control of my emotions and moods? So the psychological treatment is a very important aspect of that. From all we've talked about, for all the listeners out there, what would what would be the take home from this interview? You'd kind of want them to take. You'd want them to remember the most. Well, look, I, I think probably a few things. One is um, if you've got a relative or a friend where some of the things we've spoken about seems to be problems they're struggling with, it's probably worth getting them to see a doctor or a good psychologist just to confirm the diagnosis of bipolar. Because for many people, um, the diagnosis is either missed or is delayed for many years and means that there's a delay in access to treatment. So the first is to get assessed if, if you think someone's got bipolar. And then the second is that the treatments can make a huge difference. And um, I think that's probably the main message, that if you get the right diagnosis, the right treatment, um, it can just make an enormous impact on someone's life. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show today, Philip. No, that's a pleasure, Jack. These are good issues to talk about, you know, and these are common problems. My guest today was bipolar disorder expert, Professor Philip Mitchell from the University of New South Wales. Tune in next week when we talk with another bipolar expert, Professor Ian Hickey, in our second instalment of our bipolar series. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins, and all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.